Thank you for your time. Thank you for, t for taking that time with me. Right. I really appreciate it. And, you know, despite all the you know, things okay. going on, <laughs> it's, it's an enjoyable discussion, trust me. I'm doing that generally in, in the spirit of truth. I'm not here to you know, cut anything you care, or anyone down. I'm sure. just really interested in what you've got to say. I will push back if I don't, you know, if we, but what I think you're saying doesn't make sense to me. But How, Would it be interested if you didn't have any counter back? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if you agreed with everything, you would be Muslims by, by, by all of them. But, at the end of the day, we would like you to become a Muslim, and that's why I'm I'm willing to take your pushbacks and and try to answer them as you go along. All right. So I wanted to come back to prophecies, as in the the, the actual kind of evidence mm. um, for Islam. R r yeah. If you take away the prescriptions like that, so this, um, I mean, prophecies and miracles don't really speak to me in general. Like I think I, okay. I think, and also applies to biblical miracles, by the way. Okay. Like I don't think that those are particularly. Sure. I don't really resonate with that. But just for sake of argument, one point that you mentioned last time, you mentioned this book of 500 miracles that the Prophet did. I said 300 miracles. 300, yeah. sorry. But the Quran itself states, I think, several times that there are no signs given to Muhammad. No, like, this is what we explained before as well. This is what the, the, the Quranic picture of what a miracle is. Anytime miracle is sent, people try to people in their habitual nature, they disbelieve in the miracles. So God says, Ma mana'aka. Nothing has prevented me from sending miracles except the people of the past disbelieve in them. So in general, God is not willing to provide miracles and miracles to make people believe because people in their nature, they disbelieve in the miracles. So even when he sends miracles, they keep on disbelieving in it. That's point number one. Point number two, God does not give in to people's demand of miracles. They say, okay, you know what? Give me a mountain of gold, I'll believe, for example. He's not going to give in to this kind of miracles because these are silly claims people want to make. Even if what it was the because the Quran says even if there were mountains of gold, stairs going up to heaven, the dead were to speak, they will still not believe. Because belief is not just what they are demanding miracles for as a belief. It's something which is in their heart, the stubbornness and arrogance and pride and many of their psyche, the ego. That's the problem, not about the evidence. So, Quran does not in any way say, oh. Prophet Muhammad was not going to be given any miracles. The Quran says miracles is a matter of time. But it will never be given according to their dictates. And the Quran says that when the miracles are given, the ayats are given, the example I've given you about the splitting of the moon, when they see the sign, they say this is you know this is a this is a magic, you know, perpetual magic and so on. So miracles were performed by the Prophet. The Quran does not somehow say no, it didn't. The Quran affirms that was the case. But people's reaction is it's magic and the Quran reprimands them like you know what, what's there for you not to believe you see it within your own eyes and you disbelieve so these are the people that really we're going to have to have a good accountability in the hereafter because seeing something in front of their eyes which it cannot be accounted for as a natural thing that people do like magic and things like that some people are learned this trick when they could see clearly if you and I were there and the see parted by the staff of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Camille, are you going to just say, let me rub my eyes, you know, what am I saying? Am I, uh, am I be having some kind of delusions with some narcotic gas? You're not going to see that. You see that on front of your face. This is called Ainul Yaqeen. This is your truth, reality of your own eyes. You saw that in your own eyes. You are not going to question like, oh, this didn't happen. That will be an evidence against you at that point if you didn't believe in it. So when miracles do happen, and some people just disbelieve in them by saying this is a magic like they did with Christ and they did with Moses. These people will really have no excuse in the day of judgment. In that judgment day, they will have to account. OK, here, that was an evidence in front of you. Why did you disbelieve and reject the evidence? What are they going to say? Oh, I was deluded. Because there will be no counter back there'll be no pushback from them because they cannot argue against it because you could not explain that this was not a miracle performed by a prophet and a messenger that's what we are talking about quran affirms miracles of the prophet and the one of the examples i've given you the quran clearly says is about splitting the moon when they see when they see that's they right see that again. uh the quran does ignore the heckler i'm not i'm not no, no, don't even fact, listen to the heckler. Commentators say that that's a sign of the end times, not Muhammad doing it. So Look, actually, you're right, Camille. Camille, there yeah. is nowhere in, in the Quran where it says that So this is, the, this is the chapter here. It talks about the miracles of, of uh, Musa, of Isa, even Abraham, but not Muhammad. 
is through a foot 54 versus one. And yeah, now the time to has me come. That, just <laughs> Our junior and the moon did run to center. It's well, happened, Muhammad, right? Yeah. Nowhere. You could even read Tafim Al-Quran yeah. uh, by Said I'm not going to take Muhammad this example out of no, thin blue. Muhammad. Historical event. And it hasn't happened yet. When they see a miracle, they turn aside and they say, Tamzian magic. Where's Muhammad in that time? And, anyway. and they call a lie and they disbelieve. This Where's is Muhammad? in past tense. And follow their no, low no. desires and their affairs to be appointed term. So when so when they David saw David this, the they called it magic and they disbelieved in it. Yeah, but he's got a point in that. Muhammad. Where, where's Muhammad? Uh, it's, not, it's not a, a performed specifically by Muhammad. Hang on, who did this miracle? Well, according to Sayyid Maldi. No, no, no. In here, during the time of the Prophet, the Quran was given to him, right? And he's doing that. Now what we're going to do is, we're going to be so hyper-skeptical, we're going to say the Prophet didn't exist, he didn't say this, Ooh, all the hadith are not... Try to understand. I like it. The hadith that talks about that this is a historical event that took place like this nature, this is the reaction of his people, oh, we're going to disbelieve... Later, so exactly, see? Hadith came later, like, Quran wait, wait, came wait. later. How much are we going to dismantle this skepticism uh, of the, the, the historians which are known as revisionists? Revisionism is a school of thought in historical criticism in which they try to re reject all of the historical details and say, ah, maybe he didn't exist. Maybe the people didn't exist. Maybe Mecca didn't exist. Do you know that? Yeah, yeah. They're even talking about saying Mecca didn't exist. Subhanallah, the Prophet didn't exist. So what do we say about these people? The hyper-skeptic revisionist, you are against the historical memory of the people, going against the data. We have historical data of a place, of the people, and their artifacts, and their beliefs, and their systems, and their writings, all of it. How much do you want? Writings after writing, in inscriptions, in papyri, in, in, in writings and later works. No sane historian would doubt, for example, Prophet Muhammad existed and he preached in Arabia and he had this kind of belief about him. No sane wonder. Hyperskeptic, revisionist, fruitcakes may believe in that. Just like hyperskeptic, revisionist, fruitcakes believe Jesus did not exist. Yeah, oh, mean, he accepts Jesus didn't exist that, because. Camille, Camille. Don't engage with them. No, 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 you're right. You're right. I'm corrected. So you can't help we help agree again. there are. Christians, because of this consistent approach, they will say, because we have a historian who doubts the existence of Christ, Christ didn't exist. They need to be consistent. So now maybe that is the view. Christianity didn't exist. All of these writings, come on, doesn't matter. Do you see the point? Cakes. So yeah. that's yeah. why, that's why we call them fruitcakes because these are hyper skeptics. They go against history. So when it comes to miracles, when it comes to miracles, what, what, what happens when the Quran says that Christ was crucified? Isn't that being a fruitcake? Stop it! Go, go for it, but it's interesting. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. No worries. Do you understand English? She said, "Go away." No, say in Arabic, Mansour, please. She said, "Go away." In Arabic, Mansour. Appreciate it. Go away. She said, go away, not me. She said, go away. No problem. Go for it. She said, go away. Alright, sorry, you were saying. She, he has no respect for you. It's okay, but that's what Hector is doing. I'm sure there's something in it. Right, I agree. I agree that you've understood. Now we're on the same boat that you agree that he's a heckler. Good. So now we move on. So, but, but to say, there's probably, you know, I don't know about. So that book about 300 authentic miracles, you, in your mind, is this the Quran denies the miracle performed by the Prophet Islam. So how can he have done miracles? As I explained to you, the Quran does not deny. The Quran denies what thing? Miracles as expected by people, demanded by people. God doesn't give in to these kind of things. God gives his own miracle. And that's why you will find within the Christian text, there's one point Christ said, I think I mentioned this before, no sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. So Christ himself make a condition. I'm not going to give you all the signs that you demand. Do this, do that, whatever. Nothing will be given to you. No sign, except one sign. So here we have a consistency of the messengers in terms of how they deal with these kind of hecklers at their times, um, trying to give me evidence, give me evidence. They do not fall for their trap, right? And their, and their, and their, and their 
ego business of, you know, give me something I will believe. In fact, they would not believe. So the Quran tells us that this is a miracle. The Quran, you know the Quran? It says itself, itself consists of evidence, ayat. Every single verse, we don't use the word verse, but you know what a verse is, a sentence, is called an ayah of the Quran. An ayah is a miracle, a sign, a proof, an evidence, all of that. Quran itself, in its individual component, is called a miracle. Yes, I want to come back to that, because that's probably, actually, of all the things that we talked about, that's the only thing, that's the, probably the one that speaks to me the most, is the inimitability of the Quran. I think it's because I have, I'm a linguist, I, you know, I... Did I, you watch ChatGPT? I did, I did, it was really interesting, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, so I, I need to do more research on this. I please would, do, please do. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned, actually, in that video, you mentioned a lect series of lectures that you did on the, on yeah. the and I couldn't find those, so I don't know. So the lectures are called the, um, I'll show you which ones, so you can uh, listen to them. <laughs> There's three parts, three lectures in three occasions. So let's see which ones they're called in Dawa Wise. I mean, what it say, will save me from giving you all that information that I did in three, three parts, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. It's called Linguistic Miracle of the Quran. Okay. There's three parts in Dawah Wise. Yeah. yeah? Okay. okay. So originally it was uploaded in a different one, so that's fine. So yeah, so I mean, I don't want to get into too much detail on that, but that's probably out of all the things that I've heard, that's the only one that I caught, that you're watching your video, it was actually really interesting to, and I, I think I need to, and I think it's probably in the visual mind of actually learning Arabic and understanding how it works on this. So yeah, I can't really debate that, but the superficial understanding that I have is that it might have been because the Quran was actually influenced by other languages, like Syriac or that kind of stuff. Is there anything to that? Is that something you addressed in the, in the lectures? Yeah, but the question is, we're talking about the Arabic language itself, even though the Quran can have words of different linguistic origin, the fact remains the composition of such a way. It's not just individual vocabulary. Yeah. Like for example, the word Illiyin, the word Sirat, uh, they may have a cognate or something similar preceding the Arabic language, but the Quran can e either use something from another linguistic culture and use it and Arabize it to the Arabic uh, people for their understanding, because it, no need to reinventing wheel within the Arabic grammatical linguistic vocabulary structure I, 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 a whole, within the framework of the Arabic vocabulary because you know how the words are derived for example the word globalization didn't exist in the Arabic corpus but now what does it say in Arabic globalization <laughs> the root words are ain, lam, mim. right to know Alima, ya alamu, to know. And from this, like, you can have so many different meanings. Globalization, where you can have the world. And because of a root word, it can have meaning attached to it. For example, the word alaqa. The Quran says how human beings go through the stages of alaqa. And people say, oh, that's wrong. It doesn't mean that. But if you look at the word alaqa, in its root word means it's some kind of connection, something that is hanging. Hanging. So I'm more unlock that you, you know, if you see some traditional places in my country or in our country, they make something with rope and so on, and they hang their pots and things on that. It's called mu'allak, right? Alaqat, relationship, because we hang with each other, right? So each word can be derived from a root word. This is beautiful Arabic language and, and of course, probably Semitic language the same, right? So when it comes to the Quran and its uh, linguistic miracle, of course, the Quran brings in new terms, which the Arabs didn't know them before, but it Arabizes them from the Arabic stock. So the word Quran itself, you'll be surprised, was not known to the Arabs what it meant. There is no pre-Islamic poetry which has the word Quran in it, because it didn't, this particular form, Quran, did not exist in their vocabulary. So the Quran introduced even the name of this book, which they're not familiar with, but something from a root word, Qara'a, it means to recite, to read, and so on, in that form. The word Surah, a chapter, 
was not known to the people in this meaning. Sura was like a fence. But the Quran is introducing a meaning and it, it describes Surah and and so on, and, and it tells you what it means at the same time, defines it. This it, it has a border, a fence all around it, a, a thematic unity. The word ayah, verse, and ayah wasn't known to them in the meaning. To them, ayah had a different meaning. So the Quran introduces even the words with a newer meaning and, and explains and defines as it goes along. So the ling new linguistic language, the new language the Quran brings, which they couldn't have thought about, the Quran within its recitation, it explains it. So people didn't have, why are you speaking gibberish? You know, when a child speaks gibberish, after hearing few times, a mother or a father, or brother, sister, they know what it means. If you heard it first time, you wouldn't know what it means. The child speaks gibberish. The Quran came and spoke in a language which was unknown to them in their mind, but they understood not only that this is an eloquent way of expressing it, but they understood the meaning and yet it wasn't in their vocabulary. That is the linguistic um, uh, secrets of the Quranic language. Yeah, that, that I wanna, I'll, I'll yeah, watch yeah. your videos and I'll come please back do, to Please it, do, please do. I mean, that, to me, that's the only one where everything else I'm kind of like, oh, doesn't really... Contradictions. Know. What about the contradiction claim? If the Quran was not from any other, if the Quran was not from God, it was from anyone else other than God, then you will find many ikhtilafan. Yeah, well, that, I, I never really quite understood that point because to me, there are lots of places that seem to contradict each other. Do you agree in principle? A book from God talking about history, about future, about contemporary affairs, about secrets of your heart, about the natural world, about politics, anthropology, social, all these things. If a book from God is talking all about it, it should be free from errors and contradictions. Um, in or should it be? In principle, yes, but if it's yeah. been mediated through humans, then it's subject to errors. No, first of all, in principle, this is what I'm asking. You expect yeah. a book of God should be free from errors. So when the Quran makes that claim that this is the Quran with all its forms of guidance on every aspect of our life, it talks about embryology, it talks about astrophysics, it talks about biology, it talks about the ancient East and ancient West. If it wasn't from God, you expect it to be contradictory, erroneous, having lots of contradic you know, discrepancies. It's not that any book on any matter, if it's free from contradictions from God, a, a phone book, may be free from contradictions, but it doesn't make it from God. But the phone book does not talk about yeah. the ancient world and the future world and the humans and the natural yeah. world. Yeah. If it did, then you expect it to contain mistakes. Yeah. But then on that point, then why would verses be abrogated? Then? No, abrogation is of what? Abrogation, God says very clearly that ma nansakh min ayatin aw non siha. Is it how it goes? Anyone knows the ayah? We do not, what's the ayah? Right? So, he does not abrogate or makes an ayah forgotten until he brings something better or similar to it. It's all about making the society in the, what's this called, um, rehabilitated, reha rehabilitating them and making them. So God can condition a society with a certain particular specific laws and then he will say, that's fine, now we have different laws. Just like, say, a law of Adam and his children, how they had to, um, twin sets had to marry each other, to human beings to procreate, because there wasn't another human being separately created and they married, because only one man and one woman, from them we all came. So the law of, for example, marrying sisters and brothers is now no longer applicable. But at that time it was okay. So God, for a community, he can instill and give guidance and laws and he can say these are no longer necessary for now but for future that is not necessary well, then why would certain verses like the one about slavery not be abrogated then? could be slavery will be as, as i said certain laws can be there because it will take long time as we explained before to get it eliminated or slavery will be there such they will be very difficult to eliminate so that means conditions may be there and you need to have rules and regulations and solutions for it. So we're getting new Quran verses like sometime in the future? Do you follow? So God here is not abrogating slavery. This is a law. He is trying to encourage it to be eliminated through the processes and mechanism God has put in place. Can God ever make a mistake? What do you think? 
I'm asking you in your I opinion. will answer, but what do you think? No, 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 no. I'm asking your opinion of it. I will answer. You're, so that's why I'm asking no, you. Sure. Wait, wait, God will never make mistakes. So God can never make a mistake? Of course not. Okay. We are going through right now every era in the world, every disaster that we're going through, along with all the good, that's all part of God's plan. Is that what you're telling me, yeah? I'm telling you, anything that happens, it happens with the will of God. Yeah, I know, listen, the, the will, I, the, the, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really concerned about the will. I'm saying, is, is he aware? Is that part of He's the aware. Plan? So there's no, everything's going to plan. Nothing can go against his plan. So everything Everything going plan. is going to his plan. Right. Nothing right. can go against the plan of God. Right, so all of the disasters that are going on right now, that everything, is enduring, everything. This yeah, is part of God's plan. Everything. In order to do what? Hmm? What's hmm? the process? What's the end? What's the end? What's the end? Hang on, hang on. What, what I want to understand is this. One second, one second. Before I go into answering one question of the, like, a, you know, series of questions. Sorry, I did. I, no, 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 no problem. I want to understand one thing. Yeah. What does that prove? That God doesn't exist? What does what? Prove? What does your questions prove? If everything, if there is evil in the world, what does it prove? Well, if there is suffering, one second. Yeah, go on. If there is suffering in the world, mm. if there is all this evil in the world, mm. what does it prove? Does it prove that this non-existence of God? No, I'm just trying to understand the logic of things, right? Because there is so many things happening, but you have to throw some sort of logic by it. Yeah. And if logic comes correct and you say there is no problems, there is no error, and God hasn't done... It's not about error. But I just said, has God ever made a mistake? Let me come back to you again. No, this is the... not about an error. This is not a human experiment that God has in which human has a trial and error and God didn't know about it and God regretted it. What we're saying is God has given in this world, which is not utopia. This world is a place of test. There will be suffering. There will be this kinds of evil, evils and things like this. There will be pain, but there will also be joy. There will be a contrast between good and evil and you acquainted with the faculty of choice of knowing what is good and evil, you are supposed to, you're obligated to fulfill your purpose in life by balancing these things and worshiping God and then God will place you in a place of no evil, no pain. Okay. No suffering. So, so, That's so paradise. Or, or you're not listening. No, you're formulating your question. No, because no stop, stop, so stop. No. Point, when you back. asked a question, yeah. So actually, so the problem of evil. That you know, when I, at the beginning, I was saying I have things that I think Christianity and Islam don't have good answers to. Yeah. The problem of evil is obviously one of them, right? It's a very ah, famous kind of uh, philosophical problem, whatever. So, so your point there is that because the because the world, this world is a is a test. This life is a test. That's why there is evil in the world and suffering. So that makes sense. I, know, I, I I would agree with that. But then, what do you make? What is the meaning of menial suffering or you know, for instance, animal suffering? So animals do animals don't go to don't go don't have an life life. Any say two animals fought with each other. One broke his hand, a horn, or something like that. In the day of judgment, God will recompense them. God will recompense them. But do Even animals. animals. Do animals have a soul? In Islam? Animals. What do you think? I don't think animals have souls. Well, yeah, so animals. So do, they, do, they do they have souls? Yes. Yeah, so if they don't have souls, then how, how do they have an afterlife? No, no. They don't have afterlife. Okay, so they won't have afterlife. Okay, so In a day of judgment, they, if they have disputes, like, like you're saying, questioning, oh, what are they going to do? Some, something has happened, like one animal violated another animal, whatever. Yes, they they will be given, and that that will be it. That's it. But so then. What in this life then? What because the one reward, happen? perpetual life, is the human that's going to have. That is what is God created us for. So the animals and so on and so forth, these are all, in fact, Allah says in the Quran, everything here, وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمُ shams. Even the sun has been created to be subservient to us. Qamar and the moon, everything of the creation that you see, has been created for us to be our subservient so that we can enjoy our life and fulfill our obligation in this life. Okay, but fine. If, but if you take that, there are millions of years during which there were no humans in, on the planet, right? There are millions yeah. of years where there I don't know, I don't know if it's millions of years, but, but well, yeah. at least enough time. Whatever, enough time. Yeah, yeah. So what was the point of all that, all that suffering that happened during that? What, what, what do you mean by suffering? Well, I mean, God, animals, look, so, look, okay, so, let's understand suffering yeah. again. When you say suffering, so when a lion eats a zebra or a deer, 
you're saying the zebra is suffering. Yeah, pain, I guess. Yeah, yeah. pain. And you're saying that's, that shouldn't be the case. So well, the, yeah. the lion should have been created without any hunger or thirst. Yeah, Ultimately, so, what you're asking for yeah, yeah, exactly. is so, what will be so, provided in heaven where you would not need to eat, but you will eat for pleasure. Yeah, but precisely because I understand the point that you're making is that the meaning of pain and suffering for humans is that it's a test, it's to, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about. But for animals who don't, go to, don't get an afterlife, well, what's the point of their suffering? Because they don't have the spiritual necessity to have an enjoyment or a punishment in the hereafter. So God did not create them that way. Yeah, God created them and that's it. So if, for example, if an animal were to have, like, okay, you know, something was violated against them in the day of judgment, that will be it and that will be it. That's it. They will be like turned into a dust and that will be it. Yeah, I mean, they don't need a continuous hereafter. This judgment is done between them and that's yeah, it. But then that, then I, to me, that's a, that's a difficult statement to, to reconcile with the fact that if you've got an animal that's suffering, not a, you know, in, a complete, in a way that's like completely independent of a human Look, being. Like, I the, know, it, no, I understand. When God gives his judgment, punishment and reward, nothing will be in such a way that that will be called least of injustice. He is not to the least unjust to his worshippers. So in the day of judgment, whatever recompense they have, everyone will be happy and content. You and I may disagree now, oh look, um, how can it be, how can, how can a murderer, the victim, and the one who commit the criminal, at the end of the day judgment they will have some kind of judgment. The victim himself, herself, or itself will agree to the judgment that is given and the consequence that follows will be content with it. That is what we're talking about because God will not be unjust to any of those things that we're describing in terms of pain and suffering. To give, I'll give an example, I think before, the person who was in hellfire, say for a long time, was just dipped into heaven for a fraction of a second. And God, this is in the hadith of our Prophet I'm not just making this up. If, did you know anything about sorrow, pain, suffering? That person may have been there for millions of years in hellfire. One dip in heaven will say, no, I knew nothing of pain and suffering in prayer. Because this recompense, the compensation that is provided, to give you an example of compensation, someone stole your watch. The compensation, one billion pounds. All the cars you want, all the money you want, all the land you want, you would not think about loss anymore about your watch. Now with this money, you can get hundreds and thousands of watches. The compensation God provides as he confirms and if he affirms will be to such a scale, no one can complain against God. They will be happy and content. That's the level of justice that we are saying God will provide. So we have firm faith in that. In terms of the actual mechanism, in terms of what's going to happen, that's the detail. But God has confirmed for his worshippers or anyone, you know, his slaves, he's not to the least unjust. Dhalam is like the highest oppressor, right? But he's not even to the least any of that. Because he is just al Adil. Not only Adil, Adil, like justice. You know, sometimes Christians say God is love, and we say God is loving. In Islam, one of the attributes of God is al Adil. Justice. Not just, but justice. Al Haq truth you say like someone is truthful but Allah is al haq truth so yes there are certain attributes in which the the adjective is used in such a way rather than say a noun yeah just to demonstrate the grievousness of these concepts and attributes so the problem of evil is only a problem to the atheists and the Christians because their theodicy in such that they may have to explain it in that way in Islam we believe Allah is wise as well as someone who is well-wisher of any good, like he is the one who is the source of all truth. Because of his wisdom, that is why he even says, for example, you know, you see the good and the bad, the one who sees and the one who doesn't see, how can you judge equally? The contrast is there for us. Would you know what is happiness if you didn't know anything about pain? You would not appreciate in its full depth what is really, you see, when we suffer pain and then we have happiness before or after, we appreciate more. So the appreciation yeah. is in contrast. Yeah, I think that, that, that is why in this world you have that contrast. That makes sense in the heaven, 
in heaven there is no contrast pure joy pure happiness no suffering no you know sorrow no grief as I said the animals they will have their recompense and their compensation that they, they will have and if even if that is the end of it because God's plan look God could have okay one thing I want to ask you why do you expect God to make you live forever and forever why would you expect God to create you and give you a life of eternity is no end why it's God's choice. He could create you and that's it. So he could create animals and that's it. They're only a mechanism in this life, how we understand and how we develop ourselves. Yeah, and we'll die and suffer. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But I'm saying all of that is, has a recompense, compensation. People get killed, but, are compensated. But the re recompense is the afterlife. Okay? No, I'm saying they do not have to have a continuous means of afterlife in which they have to live forever, forever within the animal kingdom and so on and so forth. If their existence is annihilated and only thing is there, like if you wish something, I want to eat some the, the, the meat of a bird and the bird is now created, comes up to you and then you eat of that meat and so on and so forth. But they do not have to have. If you want, for example, I'm sure if you want, I want a pet dog in hereafter. This is your wishes. If that doesn't contradict anything of God, I'm sure it will be granted. But we don't go into all of these details if our... If our the guidance from Islam is silent about it. Like somebody says, I want to play football, I want to win. And he says, I want to win too in the match. Well, that cannot be granted. Why? Because you're generating contradictions. In heaven, there cannot be contradictions. There cannot be conflict of will. You know, people say, look, oh, in the Quran or in Islamic teaching, you, you believe everything that you wish will be granted. So you say, I want to play against Mansur and I want to win and Mansur wants to win. How can you win a game? Both cannot win. So, so this kind of wishing would not be given. Contradictions, logical impossibility, logical impossibility will be removed. Oh, I guess, so is it that? And I gave an arbitrary example. There could yeah, yeah, yeah. be many examples where you generate contradictions, yeah. uh, you, you, you create a very incoherent picture. What we are saying, the Quran tells you there will not be any, any ill feelings, any grief, and so on and so forth. That means our human psyche will be transformed in such a way in which you would not wish where there will be generation of conflict of will, where I mean, logical whole, impossibilities arise. Will, like logical impossibilities, impossibilities yeah, would not yeah. arise in heaven. Then, yeah, so I feel like, like one last point on the on the evil in the field, then I need to call it for a day. But, <laughs> again, <laughs> but on that, so animals uh, versus human, right? There's like a clear distinction between the two. Humans have souls, go to heaven, or the you know, afterlife. Animals don't. But that is at odds with the fact that you know, there were like there was a continuum of evolution, and I'm not talking necessarily the, the theory of evolution, but the fact yeah, yeah. of evolution where you know um, it was animal, 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 and at some point human. And there seems to be there's like a dichotomy. There's been something that's been said at some point. You're human. You get the soul. You get to go to heaven, and you have to do it. And then everything that comes before that doesn't. Yeah. And that to me is what like, I, what that I, is, I understand yeah. your point. What you're saying is, look, all form of creation should have some reward or punishment. A tree, for example, you're saying that tree provided the shade. You, it provided so much fruits and vegetables. It should be rewarded. It should have a heavenly life, afterlife, and so on. You know, this is the expectation you are coming up. I'm saying God can decide to continue the existence of something as long as as he wants according to his wisdom. He can have human beings forever and forever if he wish. He can have certain creation up to that point if he wishes, for example. This is the prerogative of God, how he wants to continue the perpetual existence of certain form of creation. So the recompense, the reward or the punishment you are saying, you are expecting everything that is here in this world, even a bacteria, even the viruses. Let's talk about them. There are good bacteria in our gut that helps digestions. Are you expecting a reward for them that they should continue in the hereafter? You can bring in all of these things and you will say, I expect them to have a reward in heaven as well. So what we are saying is God in his wisdom, he has certain creation in mind to be rewarded in the hereafter. In his world of creations, for example, he can create a world in which there are other creation with other rewards, other punishment. God is constantly creating. Yeah. 
this world of ours is one of these many worlds. So we have a companion who says, like, there's like a parallel world. There are parallel prophets, parallel you over there. God can create that. But what we're dealing with is our existence, our soul. You and I know, you're not, I'm not Camille and you're not Mansour. We have our individual existence and awareness of the existence. What is there for us is a continuity of life with a given a new body of our soul, because what I am, I am my soul with my body that can be changed and rechanged if necessary. In the hereafter will be a different body and a mechanism to enjoy what I have done here. And that enjoyment would be spiritual, would be physical and so on. Now, if, for example, I'm saying, look, I'm not giving you a blanket statement about animals. I'm saying if there is nothing contradictory and people wish and God, even God has some, I'm, I don't know all the text. If someone can correct me, if there are texts in which there are animals can live, no problem. I don't see any problem. But I'm saying in general, even if there wasn't a afterlife for animals, this is the paragraph of God in which anything, any suffering they had, they will be compensated and they will not feel in any way unjustly treated. So I agree, I mean, you can explain away to some extent everything on that, but it's just, it's, it is a very contrived... Um, okay, a very contrived I will come back with yeah. beneficial bacteria. Yeah. Yeah. According to your expectation, there should be beneficial bacteria having reward. Well, so we want now well, bacteria well, actually, in heaven. Actually, I'm not actually, there is an alternate explanation. The, the simpler explanation would be there is a God yeah. that has set up a bunch of rules and laws and, yeah. you know, a created universe, created the things and let them, all of them, um, and evolve and develop according to his plan, but it's not materially then intervening on, oh, you'll get a reward, you won't get a reward. It's yeah. just like, that's all part But, of the yeah, yeah. To, the question is about continuity of existence. So we are told we will have continued existence either in, in, in heaven or in hell. Okay? The jinns is another creation, likewise. In terms of other creation, for example, now if somebody you know, questioning about viruses and bacteria, certain bacteria is good for you, right? In their gut, they really help digest. You, you, you do know that, right? In fact, people take probiotic, full of bacteria, isn't it? Yeah. We actually consume bacteria for the goodness of our, of, of our gut. So if people say now, okay, What's the reward for them in the hereafter? Should they be in heaven as well? Well, if God wants to have their bacterial heaven, of course he can have a bacterial heaven for them and so on. But God is interested in the humans in terms of what we are other than, you know, you interested in everything else. There are many things which are not necessary for us to delve into. If you do have questions, that's why the Quran at one point said, look, if you have questions, like this, while the Quran is being revealed, then it will be answered. Like if you have, but yeah, actually, a question on that, because obviously, in the Christian understanding, mm -hmm. the reason why God cares about humans is because humans were created in the image of God. But that's not the case in Islam, right? So, in Islam, why does God care about humans specifically, as opposed to everything else in, in His creation? Yeah. God considers human beings one of the best of creations. In the eyes of God, one of the best Ashraf al Makhluqat. One of the best of creations Allah created us. In fact, if you think about it, we are the top of the food chain in that manner. We, are we in fact, human beings are going to space, not not an, a, an elephant or a bacteria, human beings. So God created us in this way, and He has the whole human project in a way that the consequences of them is going to be either eternal heaven or eternal hell, like that. But in doing so, human beings are placed in an environment in which. There are other forms of creation and we have to encounter and engage with these creations in the best possible way. That is why Islam says look after your environment and look after the things in your environment. Don't go and kill unnecessarily unless for example for food and so on. So we can't have a, a farm of rabbits only for fun by hunting with our foxes. Totally forbidden because that's suffering for fun. But God has granted us permissibility, permission to consume them some animals for food but he doesn't ask grant us to eat all forms of food because he says there are some which are good for you and some which are not halal and tayyiba we talked about pure and permissible so we only consume what god has given permission for which are by their nature they're good and they're permissible camille Think, What's any uh, next question? Uh, I mean, I think for today that's probably enough. I've, okay, I've that's more fine. More than I need to go and read. Oh, I think sure. the big thing that I need to. But I feel like that's going to be. Inimitability. Inimitability. Certainly. Do watch the lecture. Um,
And in the meantime, take care. And yeah, thank you again. Keep again, your again questions. I just want to say again, thank you for your time and thank you for being generous with your time. I, I really appreciate it. It may have been wonderful. <laughs> with, even with the hecklers, you know, you, you, you stood your ground and you told in, and you told the heckler to go away. That was really, really good. And I hope the heckler think, at I least mean, appreciates what it means.